Hello, and welcome to the MIG Plus One podcast, where I sit down with industry leaders to discuss the project to product movement. I'm Mick Kirsten, founder and CEO of Tastop, and best selling author of Project to Product How to Survive and Thrive in the Age of Digital Disruption with the Flow Framework. Joining me on today's episode is none other than Dave Snowden, Chief Scientific Officer and founder of the Cognitive Edge and director of the Kinevin Center. Dave is known for developing Kinevin, a framework for decision making. I can say that this framework has shaped my thinking around sense making, planning, complexity, and all of these other decisions that we're constantly making and trying to understand the right context and path for more than just about any other thinking tool that I have used. So I'm just delighted to have such a deep thinker and profound thought leader on the podcast. So with that, let's get started. Hello, everyone. I am delighted to have Dave Snowden join us on the podcast today. Hello, Dave. Happy to be with you. And for those of you, I think we have a lot of thought leaders in the community uh, who have actually dug quite deep into the Kinevin framework. I know it was John Willis who, who first pointed me at it when I was writing Project to Product. And I realized that as a thinking tool, as a way of understanding and analyzing uh, different methodologies that I was seeing used across Agile and DevOps and large-scale digital transformations, that this was probably the most important knowledge or thinking tool that I had come across. And that so many organizations who are actually applying the wrong methodologies or the wrong approaches uh, were not understanding some of what Dave has made, I think, so crisp and clear in terms of how we need to have different sense-making approaches to different types of work, different types of transformations. And Dave, I'm sure you've seen this, but you know, you'll see a, a lean startup transformation that's, that's done in all the wrong context, and you'll see scaled agile frameworks being applied in very cookie cutter ways and not actually uh, producing the right kinds of results. So I would just, as we start, and maybe it would be great for you to, to talk a, a bit about your journey to, the, to how you discovered the, the Kinevin framework and some of, some of your past, but really take us through the, the entire framework and how you've actually seen some you know, efforts around agility, some of the existing methodologies, some of the things that we've seen more recently with DevOps go sideways or go in the wrong direction by not understanding some of these first principles that I think you so clearly outlined. But if you could get us just started telling us about your journey and how you got here, that'd be great. So my, my background in IT, I mean, there's an earlier background, was designing and building decision support systems for the like of Guinness PLC. And that was in the early days of computing. In fact, I started programming on mainframes where we charged people for MIPS. So I think we charged Guinness quarter of a million dollars to do their management accounting once, twice a year. And we, if you were a bad programmer, they paid more money because we charged them for machine processing (laughs) units. And the battery backup from the mainframe was bigger than most office blocks these days because we only had three and a half minutes to close down the computers in the case of fire. So it's those sort of days, right? And that was actually quite interesting because I'd actually been a financial director before that, then moved sideways into computers and consulting. And it's where we are now with sort of low code. We were then with four GLs. It's kind of like I I knew what they needed, not what they were asking for. And that, that was actually quite important. So that ability to code and build it. And then I got into some of the early stage stuff on AI. So we started to use things like Smalltalk and things like that to try and automate decisions. And I think two things happened then. Some of us looked at it and said, okay, this isn't going to work. So we need to find ways in which technology augments human decision making but doesn't replace it. And another group of people who are still around today said it's only a matter of time before we got an algorithm which will do it all anyway. So this is like the whole singularity nonsense. I mean, if you believe in the singularity your brain has decayed to the point where it's probably possible for you right i'm glad i don't that's that's reassuring to hear (laughs) human it's it's interesting i mean we we take a natural science approach human consciousness is a distributed function of the brain and the body and its environment it's not co-located with the brain and it's not a series of binary impulses so either way, so that's that was interesting because I actually knew what they wanted. I got to run the business and got promoted and then became strategy director. And then IBM bought us. So we were an Anglo-Dutch um, systems integrator. And I created a thing called the Genus program. 
um, which was the turnaround. We were a management buyout, you know, shares dropped to a penny. We weren't sure we could pay the wages. We needed to do something. So I was on the team which worked on that. And we were worldwide experts in RAD and JAD, joint application development and, and object orientation. But nobody was buying that. Everybody was buying legacy system management. You know, this is the late 80s, 90s. Mm. So what I did then, which has stayed with me ever since, is we put our RAD JAD capability together with a legacy system management method from a French company, which was the market leader, together with objects and object encapsulation. And within a year, that integrated program was 80% of our sales. We turned the company around and IBM bought us. Um, and I think that stuck with me ever since, is starting to integrate things in, in more holistic solutions and present them in such a way that people can see how technology can make a difference to them strategically, which is how we did that. Either way, I then got one of those really interesting roles in IBM, which they did at that time, which is we'll pay you some wages. We won't give you anybody to manage. Just go and do interesting things. And ended up after the knowledge wars in IBM, which were pretty nasty, running a thing called the Institute of Knowledge Management with Larry Prusak. And to be quite honest, decision support mutated into knowledge management quite easily. And that was where I became, my main line was you couldn't make tacit knowledge explicit. Uh, I took Polanyi's famous statement, we always know more than we can say, and added to that, we will always say more than we can write down. So the minute you work on text, which is what everybody was doing at that time, you're dealing with about 10% of what people know. And that triggered me into understanding the role narrative plays in human knowledge and micro narrative or anecdotes is the main method by which engineers transfer knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's not instructed document, it's by telling anecdotal stories generally of failure. And it also got me into the way that apprentice models work because it takes, this is where I was getting into the natural science, it takes two to three years for the brain and the body to co evolve around the knowledge asset base. So you can't just write it down and communicate it. There's an evolutionary process involved. So that became interesting. We're doing a lot of work then with narrative. That attracted the attention of the CIA, which was a novel experience. I ended up flying down to Washington, wondering what the hell I was getting into. As a good Welsh socialist who previously worked in the Christian Marxist commune, I was, shall we say, entered Washington with a degree of trepidation. And... We ended up running a DARPA program, a thing called Genoa 2, for both before 9-11 and then more seriously after 9-11, where we were working on how do you understand micro-narratives as weak signal detection of when a civilian population will basically support terrorism. So that was five, six years of my life, all right? In fact, I was in the Pentagon the day before 9-11 in the bit which got hit. And I flew out that night and picked up the news the next day in the UK. And it was about three weeks before I knew my team was still alive. So, wow. And then got dumped in an American transport plane in Singapore and flown back into DC with no questions asked. All right. So that all became very interesting. And eventually I left IBM. Um, the Singapore government offered me a contract to build their risk assessment and the rising scanning system. If I left IBM, so I did, and that's how we set up the company and the software and everything sort of came from that. Now, Kinevin sort of runs in parallel with this. So it's actually 22 years old now, and it's roughly its current form. And I think one of the reasons it's so successful is it wasn't a framework derived from interviewing 10 or 15 companies, which is where most of these frameworks come from or in the case of safe, half-remembered memories of three projects you didn't fully complete, all right? It was basically theory-based. It was, it was kind of like we understand the theory of tacit and explicit knowledge. We understand individual and community knowledge. Started off as a two-by-two. Two. Then it got the central domain, and then it migrated. So it gets updated about every year. So I just did a big update in March. There's another one coming. So that, that was the background to it. I should probably stop there. I can explain Kinevin having given you the background, but the key thing is it's evolved over time as more theory has come into play and more practice has come into play. So, and say the March blog post update that. Excellent. And, and I think we've had some 
people within you know the agile thought leadership sections, the le- le- circles, and people re- who really embrace lean thinking understand why this framework is so important in terms of you know, say understanding the the role of Scrum uh, and the, where it applies yeah. and where it does not apply. So if you could, and of course, this was happening at the same time. I know, you know, for me, I know my journey with Agile started with XP, right? Started with with understanding the theory of constraints through Kent Beck and through. It's interesting, as you say, it actually that the structure that this provided for the micro narratives I was having through uh, you know, code review comments and other snippets and and planning meetings at the time with 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 my open source team. So, could you connect for us the you know sort of, the sort of co-evolution that was happening around Agile? Yeah, and it's interesting yeah. because. Kinevin is about a year or so older than the Agile Manifesto, yeah? And I didn't really encounter Agile until the XP conference in London asked me to come and present Kinevin. I've got to go and... Steve Freeman knows where that was. So I've been out of IT for quite a bit of time, apart from designing this risk assessment centre. So I go into this London and meet this bunch of IT people. And it was like coming home, all right? It was just fun. And they got Kinevin straight away. I mean, XP people generally do. So then I got invited to a conference in Limerick, and that, at that point, my reputation for controversial, I didn't know who was who in Agile and Lean then. So Mary Poppendick asked what I thought was a stupid question, so I told her it was a stupid question, and I don't think anybody had done that in public before. So that, that sort of gave me a reputation and a lot of invites. So then Knavin really got picked up, yeah? And I think one of the reasons, and I think, that's the key thing we're now working on heavily at the moment. Um, we're doing some work on a multi-method, multi-vendor facilitation approach so people can construct an approach to Agile, which is based on multiple methods, not a single structured mm-hmm. method. And that was always what Kinevin was about. So if you, you know, it has three main domains, ordered, complex, and chaotic. And they're defined by constraints, though that's always a problem because people have read Goldratt and they think constraints things to be removed to improve flow. But if you come from a complexity perspective, constraints are necessary for evolution. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you don't have connectivity between things, they can't evolve. The space is equiprobable, so there's no shift on movement. So the order system is highly structured. Um, it's highly constrained. It's entirely predictable. You focus on efficiency, and that's where things like actual waterfall techniques work really very well. Yeah. And the irony here is that I remember working with Telstra in Australia, and they had waterfall projects. And it's interesting, Martin said this a lot, and so have Google. On a big infrastructure project, you don't do agile, it's waterfall, yeah. for God's sake. You know what you've got to deliver, you know how to deliver it. But nobody got promoted if they weren't agile, so they created one-year sprints so that they could say they were being agile but still do waterfall. I rather like that. (laughs) So the order domain is highly structured. It's highly constrained. You've got predictable relationships between cause and effect. And we also split that sometimes into clear and complicated. Mm -hmm. So clear, everybody knows what the right thing is to do. Complicated, only the experts know what the right thing is to do. But there is a right approach, and that's the difference. That's a really a phenomenological boundary. It's based on perception, whereas the order complex chaotic are phase shift boundaries. So it's rather like solid, liquid, and gas. Mm -hmm. If I heat water up to 100 degrees, it doesn't become steam until I put more heat in. So you you consider, you know, order is is solid, complex complex is water, chaotic is steam, everything's disconnected. So that phase shift concept is key. In chaos and... Chaos is a space which we only visit temporarily. A lot of people get this wrong. They think their software development is in chaos. If it's in there, we try and get it out fast. Unless we put it there deliberately, which takes a lot of energy, it's rather like a fusion reactor. The energy cost for the magnetic fields is more than the energy you get out of it. And we do do that. We do that on mass engagement, which I can talk about in a minute. A lot of software development is or should be in the complex domain. Um, where the key thing about complexity is everything is entangled. So everything is connected with everything else. And, you know, we talked about before the podcast about I go walking in the hills, right? Lovely phrase from Alicia Gerraro, a complex system is like bramble bushes in a thicket. So if you if you've ever walked into a small woodland and got surrounded by bramble bushes, you know the problem, right? Everything yeah. is entangled with everything else. You pull this thing and it comes out and hits you on the back, right? That's a complex system. Everything is connected. 
Whereas in an ordered system, everything is contained is probably a good way of summarizing it. Now, the thing about complexity, and this is where we get into techniques like Scrum, is the great power of Scrum is shifting things from complex to complicated. So in Kinevin terms, that's mm -hmm. a liminal domain. Because what Scrum does is it takes an articulated requirement or a backlog or a series of story points or whatever. The point is you know what the users want when you start the process. Yeah? And then it goes through a series of linear, linear iterations to produce something which is stable. Right? And the great power of Scrum as a technique is its ability to do that. So in Kinevin terms, that's liminal, complex, shifting from the complex into the complicated to create scalability that way. Yeah? In complex, and the thing that a lot of people get wrong is you don't do you don't do empirical experimentation. And empiricism is one of the, the misused words in Agile. Um, it, it, it ends up meaning whatever worked for me last time, I assume will work again unless you prove something different. And that, that's that really deficient as a method. You know, we use theory informed practice. So in the complex domain, you want multiple hypotheses that you test in parallel. And so a lot of people in Agile get this wrong. Kinevin's complex domain is safe to fail probes, not experiments, probes. Because you're probing to see what's possible and you do them in parallel, not in sequence. Because if you do one thing, you get it right. So to give three techniques which we developed, all right, to an example, one is an old DSTM technique. And if you don't remember, Agile came from XP, Scrum and DSTM. And I was one of the three founders of DSTM. And myself, my equivalent in Logica and Ed from Cambridge met in a pub in Cheltenham. That's how DSDM got sorted. Now, we were British, so it was a meal in a pub in an evening in Cheltenham rather than a week in a ski resort, all right? But one of the DSDM techniques was um, JAD sessions, joint application design, something agile community has forgotten. So we've resurrected that. So over you know, eight or nine hours, we work with fast prototypers with users in a highly structured environment to produce a prototype, which is an easier way of understanding what they want, because you can go backwards and forwards. You know, technologists know things users don't know to ask for. So chads are really good for that. And the first time we did that, we needed to get two iterations. I forgot to send the usual. So we sent it on to India, into Mumbai, with instructions to improve the prototype. But I forgot to send them the user requirement. This was a beneficial accident. That they thought it was deliberate, so they improved it. And then they sent it on to San Jose, to another team, to do the same thing. So there's a game in Britain called Chinese Whispers. I think it's called Telegram or something in the States, by which mm -hmm. a kid whispers into somebody's ear. Every time we've done that, the users look at it and say, God, we wouldn't have thought of that. Can we please have it? So that's a force mutation technique. It introduces more variety in the system. One of the other techniques we're doing a lot of is we take a young, bright coder together with somebody older and more experienced, an end system tester or a systems architect. So that's transgenerational pairing, it's called. If you put somebody young with somebody fairly old, they cooperate much better than either do with anybody between the two. It's called the grandparents. And then we put them in a threesome with a user trained to talk to IT people. It's a lot easier to train users to talk to IT people than the other way train IT people to listen to users. And then we throw 20 trios at a problem for a week and see what they come up with. So what we're doing is we're increasing diversity. And the final technique, which is, to my mind, the, the most important, has come out of a series of work that was finalized in Whistler just up the road from you, is an articulated need mapping. So what we do is we map an articulated needs by continuous journaling of user experience and then we present statistically significant clusters to IT people saying, can you improve this? So we're breaking that requirement specification story point thing, which fits people too much into a manufacturing model. The final point to make on Kinevin is that it has a fifth domain, the central domain, which is known as apparatic. So that's one of the new words of it. Aparia paradoxes. So the famous, this goes back to Dara. The Dara said, if you can answer a question, it's not a question, it's a process. A question is only a question if you can't answer it. So we have physical, artistic, and linguistic apparatus. That's what we do in that space. 
So we ask questions which can't be answered in obvious ways. And then from that, we go into the other domains. So when agile people talk about the five quadrants of Kinevin, I really rather worry about their education because you can't have five quadrants, right? There are five domains. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna. That's excellent. I'll unpack just some of this. For me, the big realization was again, you know, back to when I was running project to product, was what's going wrong, or what I predominantly see going on with large scale transformation initiatives to be you know, to to innovate and so yeah. on, is that we've got a whole bunch of tr people trained and through MBAs and other executive leadership training of the sort to function effectively in the <laughs> ordered domain and applying this basically that style of working, that style of sense making, the style of, of decision making and data interpretation to, to, to complex and chaotic uh, situations. So yeah, I, I mean, agree. It, it's interesting. I think part of it, and what's fascinating is even the ones who get complexity say they're rejecting Taylorism. And actually they're not, and none of them have bothered to read Taylor. Yeah. Um, what yeah. they're rejecting is systems dynamics, which dominated from the eighties, right? I mean, I, I taught leadership with Peter Drucker both of us came to the conclusion that Taylorism and complexity have more in common with each other than either does with systems thinking. Because what you see happens in the 80s and 90s is systems dynamics and cybernetics come in with things like business process re-engineering yeah. and learning organization. Yeah. And actually, they attempt to remove human judgment from the system. Taylor never did that. If you actually go back and you look at yeah. Taylor, human judgment, there are apprentice yeah. models of management within the system. So... Even when they do it, they tend to try and reject that approach. When The key thing to understand about complexity is you don't do transformation projects. You map the present. You work out the direction of travel. And this is what I call the Frozen 2 strategy. I've got really into Frozen 2. Frozen 2 is a great complexity movie. <laughs> and the real heroine is the younger sister. And that's what Frozen 2 is all about here, right? And she has this wonderful song, which is Do the Next Right Thing. And that's what you do. In and we need yeah. to stop transformation. You can't transform a company to make it agile. Yeah, What you have to do is, where are we? What can we change next? What's yeah. the next step? And then yeah. transformation happens as a result of multiple small actions. Yeah. It's not yeah. something you start with. The really big difference, and we see this in all systems dynamics, is they want to define the end point yeah. and then yeah. drag people there. In complexity, we define the present and we start a journey with a sense of direction, which leaves us open to novel discoveries on the path. Yeah, it's been amazing to me as I've been involved in more and more large transformations, you know, tens of thousands of engineers, IT staff, and others as part of these. And it's always the the, the destination's been mapped out, Howard, into the destination, unlike what you see in you know every digital native company out there, which is you just have a roadmap for change, yeah. for continuing to improve. But, but that's, that's, a, that's a 90s phenomenon. You, you don't, you don't, I mean, I find it fascinating, right? You get all these companies who have three-year transformation programs and yeah. five-year plans. So you have American capitalism adopting the industrial planning cycle yeah. behavior of the, you know, the Soviet Union. And what actually happens is employees get very good at gaming it. So, yeah. okay, so I've got to get a safe certificate now. Fine, yeah, I'll use that language. I'll talk about trains, yeah. So employees have got very, very clever at gaming the language. And it's actually, got, I mean, there's some interesting stuff we're doing around this at the moment in user requirements capture where we're using symbolic signification rather than linguistic signification because we're moving up a level of abstraction and that can actually give us a lot better data. So I think the danger is, and I think this is part of the problem with a lot of the flow and lean stuff, and I've had this debate with Nigel and others, is they're still taking a manufacturing model. So they're still in gold rats concept. We're taking an ecosystem model. So aspects of an ecosystem are about flow, but a lot isn't. And actually, a lot of the time, you need to increase the constraints to increase the novelty available in the system before you decide which paths to take. And that's something people are starting to understand. But as I say, if you go back and say, I had the privilege of teaching leadership with Peter Drucker, he got that straight away. Mm. And that's the sort of pre-systems thinking approach because you have managers who've grown up in the company who know each other. Yeah, you, you're never going to get rid of silos. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. I, again, I had this debate with a few of the flow guys. I said, what do you think business process re-engineering said? It said, you know, work across the silos. And, you know, after 30 years of that and six, what Gary Klein called six stigma, which is business process re-engineering on speed, 
you know, like safe is scrum on speed going too far, right? And it hasn't changed anything because silos actually are necessary. They're the only way of holding knowledge at the right level of abstraction in the company. What you need is to increase connections across the silos so that you can get fast information flow. In, in some of the talks, and we'll link to some of the, some of the, your materials and your, your talks in the in the resources section, of course, for others to follow up. But you've noted that some things have been successful at creating the right kind of structure for those narratives and for, for that knowledge transfer. And basically, you just mentioned Scrum helping move complex to complicated, so to make it more manageable, more predictable. You know, in some cases, w- with your example, where you, you know, let's say you've got a building out a new set of applications, mobile applications, uh, you're applying Scrum, but all of a sudden market dynamics change. All of a sudden, I don't yeah. know, you're a bank and, and all your users are going to the neobanks because they moved so much faster. You've actually now got chaotic elements in the market that, that now mean that, that the way that you're doing Scrum may no longer work. So how, to our audience, who is wondering how on earth to, to navigate, uh, to put in the right kinds of thinking tools, because the silos are there, and I completely agree, they're not going away. Yeah. What, what I think there's a few things. I mean, it was it was wonderfully satirized in the final series of Silicon Valley, where, where Richard ends up with this, you know, he's got no respect from his team. So yep. he clears the entire backlog board. You know, and yeah. everybody thinks it, it <laughs> they don't it. realize it's satirical for it's God's amazing. sake, all right? Yeah. No, I love that series, all right? So that was the episode. I think there are several things. First of all, it's quite interesting. If, if, if it hadn't been for Scrum, nobody would have heard of Agile. Yeah, XP is actually closer to the spirit of Agile. Yeah. But the point, and this is going to back to Asa's work in Knowledge Assets, Scrum was the right balance of abstraction and codification mm-hmm. so it could scale. Yes. Whereas actually XP was, you know, I make a metaphor here, between a taxi driver and a map user. So Scrum was a map, XP was taxi drivers. And in London, they have a two-year apprenticeship. Right. Yeah, and I remember saying that, you know, the XP people cheered me when I said they were the heart of Agile in Edinburgh. I said, but the trouble is nobody understands you. Therefore, you were never going to scale anyway. And they're still trying to work out whether that was an insult or not. Kent thinks it's a compliment. Right? So I think, you know, what we've got to do, the problem with Scrum is because Scrum is a liminal technique, people don't focus on the input. Right? So there are two things. One is the sort of methods I talked about is don't immediately, don't systems analysts are a nightmare. So to give you the raw science on this, right? if I give radiologists a batch of x-rays and ask them to look for anomalies, on the final x-ray, I put a picture of a gorilla, which is 48 times the size of a cancer nodule, 83% won't see it. Yeah. Well, that means systems analysts won't see what they don't expect to see. And story points will not capture real user experience. It's yeah. too mediated. Right? So we do things like, Clusters of real ex- anecdotal experiences from users get given to IT people. That's the unarticulated need. Don't, yeah, users don't know what to ask for in IT terms. IT can do a lot more than users know what to ask for. So it's changing the pre So That's one key thing, right? The other thing, and this is in the EU field guide to capacity management, which I was the principal author on, right? One of the key things which it says in that is build informal networks and Techniques like entangled triggers and social network stimulation will get everybody within three degrees of separation across silos within six months to a year. The reason informal networks work is they're a context-free information channel. So, for example, you know, Singapore government has got a lot of these, right, in the government because everybody in government did military service. So they had, you know, so they have the annual exercise, the officers' mess, so they all know each other, even though they come from different backgrounds. Whereas in Britain, the informal networks come from two elite private schools and one elite university. So that's Mm. unhealthy, right? But basically, in a crisis, you fall back to your informal networks, not the formal system. And the reason is informal networks are context-free information channels, while formal systems are context-specific. So one of the key things you do to create a healthy ecosystem is you very quickly create informal networks. It's rather like the fungal roots that connect tree roots to make soil healthy. You really want high network density without purpose because then that can accommodate fast and it can provide faster feedback loops. And that, if you look at it, what we're not doing there is we're not managing to output, we're managing the ecosystem which can handle as yet anticipated 
needs as it comes. It's just amazing because I think obviously a lot of the, the dysfunctions and then the extremely high functioning teams of teams I've seen exhibit, I think, you know, some of what you're saying. And so can you, I just want to step back a little bit because I think what's, what a lot of people will get out of this is just a better understanding on which, what context they're operating in, which domain they're in, right? Where the, whether it's ordered, complex, or chaotic. Mm-hmm. Now, I think one of the things that you're saying is that we do have some approaches and methodologies that we can take to turn one, you know, help bring one to the other. We do not want to stay in chaotic. You can't stay in the chaotic because the amount of energy and, and waste it's too is much so energy high. And it's yeah. a bad place anyway. Yeah, exactly. But I think what a lot of are seeing out there is, is either elements of chaotic or or at least temporarily chaotic situations where you know, market conditions change or technology stacks change or, or competitors arise. So, and I'm going to ask this, uh, uh, this question in a d- deliberately uh, uh, offensive way, but what are the best practices for technology leaders to, to identify and then thrive through chaotic events or chaotic environments? First of all, realize that chaos is always temporary. So the key thing in chaos is to realize you're in it and act first. A a lot of people don't realize they're in it until it's too late, right? The other thing is when you, and this is the only time as a senior leader you make decisions. I mean, I've been a C-level executive most of my life, right? The more you get promoted, the more you only meet angry customers, right? And that's that's life, right? But the key thing as a senior leader is you distribute decision-making, you focus on coordination. Because you can't know enough to make all the decisions. The only exception is in a crisis where you make decisions with the intention of keeping more options open for longer. You don't try and solve the problem. You make option-based draconian decisions, then you step back. So that's it. You can move into chaos. So chaos is deterministic chaos, is where nothing is connected with anything else. So if nothing is connected with anything else, it's normally distributed. So we use that for decision support. So in a crisis, you might present the crisis to the whole of your workforce. They interpret it into high abstraction metadata. And then we draw landscape maps, which show you the 18% who are seeing something that everybody else is ignoring. So that's a positive use of curves in in the way it works. So the key thing as a decision maker is to understand where you are and where you're moving between domains. And a lot of people get this wrong. Most of the time, you're moving between domains, either deliberately or accidentally. Mm You're not in a domain. If you're in a domain, it's, it's, it's fairly stable. Okay. And so I want to get your read on this because one thing I've found useful personally in sort of technology and, and building out product portfolios is to actually, as you look at the market, you look at your own offerings, your own the products and services that you bring to the market, is to actually understand where each one fits, right? And I have used actually, you know, Jeffrey Moore came up with this, uh, the, the four Crossing zones. Crossing the chasm. Yeah, this is after crossing the chasm from zone to win. So leveraging the same, I think, you know, some of yeah, the same. Yeah, I still like crossing the chasm. I think that was a bad book. You still like or don't like crossing the chasm? I like it. I like it too. That was that was the best. I think that was the uh, the best one of all of them. But I have to say that zone to win has here's here's the part I loved about zone to win. I still found use, useful day to day. So you've got this massive technology portfolio, and parts of it are absolutely ordered. Parts of it, you know, chunks are even obvious. That you've got some legacy systems you've got to keep running. Parts of it are you know, more complicated infrastructure. But what you do is you segment that portfolio of these different product value streams and you actually embrace the ones that are chaotic. So let's say, like going back to that bank example, uh, you actually want to create a lending solution or a, ch- you know, or a credit solution for, the younger, for younger generations. And you actually put in place systems, communication lines. I think back to your points on, on narratives, you have an understanding that diversity is really important that your middle-aged white people might not come up with the best banking solutions for millennials tomorrow. Yeah, but there, there are better ways of doing that. Okay. And that's where I disagree with Moore, right? So I, I took Moore's Cross in the Chasm, which I used extensively before and after I was in IBM. Yeah, that was a seminal book that I used to teach it to people. So I took that and I combined it with S-curves. Yeah? Okay. So I decided to radically simplify Moore's original Chasm concept, right? So I combine it with S-curves and some key aspects of evolutionary biology. And this this is a fractal model, so it can apply to a whole market or a product within the market. So what happens is something comes along and it stabilizes the market. So, for example, IBM, I'll give the classic Mm -hmm. example, IBM stabilized computing. Yeah. And one of the reasons they stabilized it is they repurposed their worldwide expertise in punch card control of sewing machines. 
So that gave them first mover advantage in programming. Yes. Yeah, and I, I would learn program on punch cards. I still remember it. It's good discipline. Compile error card too. You learn to think before you write. <laughs> right? um, so that was there, right? Now, what then happens is they're what's called an apex predator. So the first dominator space becomes an apex, which means they actually survive no matter how incompetent they are because the ecosystem is organized around them. But then what happens is the utility to their customers starts to drop, but they don't see it because they're still at the premium end. And the market is highly commodified, which is an early sign of this. That allows the new budget to come in left field. So IBM get displaced by Microsoft. And remember, Microsoft reused software that IBM paid them to develop, which it didn't think was significant. And then in its turn, Microsoft becomes commodified, software becomes commodified, software isn't the advantage, we go from hardware to software. Apple then dominate, and Apple repurpose next. I was partly responsible for that, actually. It's the only time I met Steve Jobs, he threw a pile of books at me, right? So we didn't sign a massive contract for next. <laughs> but next became the Mac operating system. Yeah? Now, each of those then dominates the space. So this cycle of entry as a minor player commodification is common now once you understand that you have two key points one is what we call competence induced failure so that's a reference to Clayton Christian yep. I did some work with on this companies fail not because they're incompetent but because they're too competent at the old paradigm mm -hmm. same is true of products the other point is called the exactive point and that's a reference to evolutionary biology so acceptation is where a trait which evolved for one function under stress accepts it doesn't adapt for something completely different. So the cerebellum at the base of your brain evolved in apes to manipulate muscles in fingers for feeding. It then accepts in humans to manage grammar in human language. It's too big an evolutionary leap to happen in a linear way. It requires something which evolved for one function to develop for something else. We got microwave ovens because somebody realized the significance yeah. of a chocolate bar melting in their pocket. So if you look at it, and, and several people have written this, there's an annual conference on acceptation. In order to accept, first mover advantage comes to the person who repurposes something they're already competent at to do something novel. It's not that they invent from scratch. And so to do that, this is kind of like, you know, the, the EU handbook has three things you should do. One is, the entangle your informal networks. The second is use your employees as a sensor network so you can find the 18% instantly. The third thing is map what you know at a level of granularity that you can combine with very quickly. Now, interestingly, we're taking a, sep a similar approach on something we're launching next month, which is a facilitation kit around multiple methods. So what we're doing is we're taking something like Scrum decomposing it to its lowest level of coherent granularity. So, for example, a sprint is that, yeah? What you can then do in the facilitation kit is you can peel out a sprint and you can replace it with a three-month time box. So what we're doing is to take methods down to that coherence and allow people to combine and recombine them in completely different ways. And that's designed as a radical alternative to things like SAFE, which try and consolidate everything into one huge diagram with predefined flows. And this is a complexity principle. You want to assemble things in different combinations uniquely in context. And that's how you get real innovation. So that focus on, and it's all, it's all written up on the blog. This is in the public domain as other methods, all right, and open source wiki. You need to understand those two key points, the competence induced failure point and the exactive point and where are you and map on that curve. And that can apply to a product, an organization, a manager, or a whole market. And that's fractal. It's so similar at different levels as you go through. So my problem with Moore's second book, and to be honest, the first is it's too linear and it's too category based. It's not. It's not messy enough. Right. So, and I guess, and I guess the more more recent works, I think that this is relevant, right? As I think you've made the point that leader, leaders often larger enough organizations, they're managing all domains at once. And yeah. and he has... If they've got to, if yeah. they can't do it, then they're, they're not going to survive. Yeah, exactly. So recognizing which domain you're managing. And then, of course, for me, the thing that's that's has been near and dear to try to help them is to say, you know, you can't use the same frameworks, the same metrics, the same approaches for every domain, which is exactly what's going on, right? Is that is 
these big bank transformations apply the exact same methodologies and frameworks and and metrics and KPIs for each domain. And that's that's and that, that's the big consultancy model. I mean, the other way, by the way, that you know something is coming to the end of its life cycle. It, well, there are two sides. One is the big six adopted. <laughs> because they only want large manufacturing products. The other is there are two or three authors you can guarantee will write a popular book on the subject, and that's another good indicator. But I won't name names to preserve some of my... Yeah, there is this, this commoditization phase yeah. is an early warning. I mean, I always used to say this, you know something is at the end of its life cycle when IBM adopts it as strategic. Yeah, they came late to process re-engineering, late to knowledge management, late to design thinking, Right. IBM is really good at physics. It's really crap at services. So we're at the commoditization and tail end of, I think, of, of Agile. In Agile, you're yeah. definitely there now. Yeah. I mean, so safe, I safe was an indication that Agile is at the end of its life cycle. And the so, fact that, I mean, if you look at it, I mean, the Project Management Institute in buying one of the competitors yes. is actually going to make safe stronger because it's not competing by doing something differently. It's trying to be a second rate safe and that, that niche is now taken in the ecosystem yeah. Yeah. less hasn't displaced it yeah no the apex predator is there neither will scott i mean i love scott i think this stuff is great but even with pmi he's not yeah. going to display safe i'm afraid yeah well so then i guess guidance from you on, on on what is next right i think that we've seen agile i think it has delivered a lot for teams we've seen scrum again help bring complex uh, towards more com to complicate and make things more predictable, but fundamentally, it's it has not been enough in terms of making. I don't think it's one thing. I think I think if it's one thing, it will be unhealthy. It will be stuck in the cycle again. That's why I say we 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 went open source on our methods last yeah. year, which caused a lot of difficulty with some of my staff who thought we should stay proprietary. But I said, look, this is you know what I said. But it's the age of complexity. Systems mm -hmm. thinking is also coming to the end of its days. So when something is coming to the end and you've got a reasonable position, you make everything freely available. You don't try and restrict it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we're doing. So my belief is there's a huge, there are some things in SAFE. There's a huge amount in, in XP. There's a huge amount in Scrum. There's a huge amount in Kanban. What we need is this ability to put not just the whole thing together, but to take aspects of each and put them together in different combinations. And this is really actually going back to object orientation. If you remember that from when I was on Corbett committees in the 80s, arguing that people are objects too. So what you want to do is you want to, you want methods to have defined input output so you can connect them with other methods and the same with tools. So you have a multi-vendor, multi-two approach. And I think that's the future for software development. And it's a ecological framing of the problem, not a manufacturing framing of the problem. And then I think it, it does get into some, I think some important interesting work on socio-technical congruence, right? The, the companies, and I'll just give a quick example, but the companies that manage to align their organizational structure to their software architecture and you know, basically this, this type hierarchy of object or, typically object-oriented architecture uh, yeah. and, and their business, their value streams, what they deliver to their, to their customers and to the market have but thrived. We've done that. I mean, we now organize each of our functions has three people. If the three people agree, they've got authority to make the decision, mm. right? And the threes overlap, so there's, there's strong communication. So we've created a network model of management. And we partly designed that, to be honest. Um, we were working on it anyway. Then we had to work with one of the early adopters of holacracy who have seen themselves reduced to this mind-numbing bureaucracy which only rewards people who can follow the process. So we wanted to create something a bit more fluid, right? I mean... Yeah, holacracy is designed to avoid people having to exercise human judgment. Yeah, no, I've been watching that. <laughs> a couple of the instances of that that's been applied. That's that, that's a, that's another fascinating topic. Well, I mean, medium abandoned. It. I mean, if you look at it, I mean, yeah. I can give you lots of cases. Yeah. The, the trouble is, it's it's like the. I mean, Nora Bates and I are beating up some of the citizen democracy thing is again. It's programmers trying to write a software program to do what human beings do well and they can't do it so you know the minute you make something explicit enough for it to be a computer program it can be gained right so human beings are abductive computer programs tend to be inductive in logic terms yeah yeah and that ability to be abductive is key for human intelligence so we now have these and would you agree these we have these apex predators the tech giants and they have master complexity yeah, I don't know. I'm, I've always been impressed with Apple, all right? 
And I, I think Google and Microsoft have kind of like lost it. They're into areas where they're, they're working out ways to make money and they'll survive regardless, just like IBM does, right? But they're not Apexes anymore. Apple is still an Apex. Right. And, and we've got... Amazon and I think I guess within each market there there are now apexes who've mastered technology. Yeah, and I think the issue is do they get hit on monopolies? I think Amazon mm -hmm. is more vulnerable than Apple in that respect, right? But I mean, if if you want companies that understand complexity intuitively, I would put Apple and Amazon up there as the tech giants. I think Google have a bit lost it because they their culture is fairly it's it's too techy. Yeah, it's it's just two two focuses. It's it's, it's in, in cognitive terms, it's it's mono it's monocognitive rather than diverse cognitive. Apple's always managed. In fact, Apple are brilliant at acceptation. Apple very few, very rarely invent things, but they're really good at repurposing other people's ideas for something novel. They're really good at that. And Amazon does the same thing. You know, they had to have servers, and all of a sudden that becomes their biggest business. And that wasn't planned. That was accidental. Yeah. And that's called that's called serendipity, right? Understanding how to manage for serendipity means you have to have fast enough feedback loops. You can spot something, you can reinforce quickly, and well, that's complexity. It's not systems. Yeah, ex and I said I've been looking for trends on the companies that have thrived, and you know, like you say, some of them may be thriving less in the future than they have because they were at the right place at the right time. But I think a, a common thing that we're seeing is, whether it's induced by tech giants, it's induced by, by technology or market cycles, more and more organizations are having a significant part, or established organizations, large companies, large enterprises, a significant part of their portfolio and their place in the, in the future under threat. So there's this chaotic and definitely complex element. Yeah, and the, the people I would monitor, I think, are going to be really interesting are the big oil companies. Because they're going to be forced to go through radical change yes. very quickly, and they've got a lot of cash to do it. Yeah, and I think they might be a lot more interesting than some of the tech drivers if they move fast enough. Because, because I think because the pressure on them is going to be here. I mean, yeah. we've done one project with one of them, which I can't talk about much, because actually they're having a real problem in retaining good engineers. Because nobody wants to tell their friends they're working for big oil. So some greenwashing will help with that, presumably, and some some actual genuine energy projects will help. Yeah, people are seeing through that now. To be honest, I, I mean, one of the ideas we came up with is that they they put twenty percent of their engineering time, for example, onto solving the problem of how to refreeze the poles, because that's an engineering right. problem now, not a science problem. Mm -hmm. And they're actually thinking about that. So if they ever do it, you'll know who I'm talking about. But by that time, it'll be okay. So what we're doing there is that's repurposing. We're saying, what can you do? Mm -hmm. So don't talk about something. Go and do something. Which may, And this is, by the way, another big difference between complexity and systems thinking. Systems thinking has grown out of the Northern European, North American tradition, which says you only achieve change by talking about it and agreeing where you want to be. Yeah? So you talk and then you do. Um, all the work I've done in indigenous knowledge is you do and then you talk. So you do things together and then you talk about things and that, that's an evolutionary approach. So, for example, I was working on peace and reconciliation in Ireland in the 70s and you had two approaches. One was the big sort of get everybody together in a wonderful workshop and everybody would agree they loved each other really and they wouldn't throw petrol bombs at each other again. Wonderfully satirized in episode one of series two of Derry Girls where the Catholic girls are forced into peace and reconciliation with the Protestant boys. Yeah, it's just hysterically funny, right? Um, within two weeks, they were throwing bombs at each other again. We took small groups from both sides of the fence and we dumped them into Latin America for six months and let them work out for themselves what they had in common, which was a lot more than they realized. So, and we're doing that on peace and reconciliation in the States at the moment as well. So this concept of finding things that you have in common and working together and then having conversations yeah, and also starting these parallel probes and seeing what works rather than spending a huge amount of effort. One of the big things Kinevin is about is conflict resolution and time sharing. So you're a C-level executive, all right? Been there. Eight people come in with brilliantly researched ideas. It's their source of expertise. They've been working on it for years. They know a damn sight more than you do, and you've got to choose one of them, all right? But once you get Kinevin, you don't do that anymore. You give you you get them all to agree which ideas are coherent, and to agree somebody is coherent is different from agreeing they're right. Mm -hmm. It's a lower burden of proof. Everybody with a coherent idea gets some money to run a probe, and you see yeah. what happens. And then you reinforce the good, and it generally mutates and changes the space. 
So that is a lot less energy than trying to make a decision, and it's a lot more effective. And it's those sort of skills which modern executives will have. Uh, traditionally, good executives have done that anyway. Yeah, they, they kind of like bring people in, they give people different money, they let people contradict each other, they see what happens, they sit back and watch. That's always been there. We've now institutionalized it a bit. Yeah, and, and th- I mean, I could not agree more because I've, I've observed this over and over and even, even more so the last few years. And they actually have measurement and other, other systems in place to get feedback on the probes, right? To get feedback on the experiments. Yeah. So what we're now doing in this EU field guide is we're making the whole of the workforce real-time sensor network for executive. And that's using distributed ethnography. And that's really powerful because that means not only do you know what your employees will accept, we're doing this at society level using children and young people in church groups as ethnographers. But literally within five minutes of asking a question, you can see the dispositional map of how people regard it and you can find outliers. The key thing in times of change for an executive, and this is a famous quote from Hewlett Packard, it's a cliche, but it's true. If only Hewlett Packard knew what Hewlett Packard knew. And yeah, I famously created a three word matrix once, which have known, unknown, and unknowable. Yeah. And made the mistake of presenting it in the Pentagon one day, and I couldn't use it for about four or five years since. And kind of like they forgot the unknowable element of that, right? The key, the main danger to you is the unknown knowns. And big companies have an awful lot of unknown knowns. So we've got this, you know, it's called mass sense, this way of finding that that knowledge very quickly. Yeah. Because you don't have time to exploit it. So I envision then looking at, you know, chaotic where you've got unknown unknowns. I, I always, when I look at, can have, and I always, I'm always envisioning that, let's say, the, the flow time, basically the feedback cycle that you need to actually succeed in that domain, right? Where an obvious... You need it. But the, the danger with flow metaphors, I mean, it, and, and value mapping has been around since the 70s, right? Yeah. The danger with flow metaphors is it assumes, it assumes a single direction. The, the reality is in the complex space, everything is flowing in all sorts of directions Absolutely. simultaneously. Yep. Yeah. And... That's why I'm going to say I have a lot of debates tonight. I, I wouldn't use the flow concept because the minute you talk about flow, people think about theory of constraints. They think about linearity. Yeah. And you have to change that way of thinking. But you're right. The key thing yeah. is very fast feedback loops. And to be honest, the ability to dig a little channel quickly to encourage yeah. things in the right direction. Yeah, and, and I, I completely agree, David. And I think that's why the, the notion of value stream networks, that the flows are not linear in comp. And, and anything other than obvious. There, I mean, we, we can debate. There, I'm sure there's some linear flows and complicated, but what we've actually observed by studying all of the communication data across all the systems of these large organizations is that the closer, the, the larger that you get in terms of complexity, uh, just and the closer that you get to chaotic, the more intertwined and the more thicket bush like the flows are. Yeah, but one of the ways we simplify that is to add human metadata to the raw data. So that, that's why we outpoint things like sentiment analysis, because we're not just relying on what people said or communicated in written form. We're also getting them to self-interpret that data at a high level of abstraction. And that gives us better training data sets for AI. And it gives us better data and it reduces the information volume you need to take into account. And abstraction is absolutely vital. People always forget about abstraction. It's, it's really, I mean, art comes before language in human evolution. And abstraction is key to invention. So the, the, the evolutionary argument for art is it distracts you from the mundane so you see novel patterns. And that's one of the big problems with big data. It's it's seeing repeat existing patterns or patterns, you know, patterns based on partial data. Dave, you've said that the reason the silos exist, the reason org charts exist, is, is we actually need information to cascade. Um, maybe I'm putting some words in your mouth uh, at different levels of abstraction. No, you, it, it's, it's it's abstraction against code. So this is yeah. Brass's famous ice space, and I work with Max a lot. And this is the origin of Worley Maps and Kenevin. Actually, both come from ice space. So Max had a sort of box in which you have abstraction, codification, diffusion. Mm-hmm. So if you don't have high abstraction and high codification, you get no diffusion. So that's why Scrum works so effectively. If you have low abstraction, low codification, you you don't get much diffusion because that's deep expertise. That means if you want to understand a human system, you need the abstraction in the system. It's not just the data. Mm -hmm. So you need, and that's what we specialized in. So I can 
I can gather data from every single employee on an abstract level, literally within 30 seconds, and put that into the system along with the raw data. And it's actually quite fascinating. We've done competitive work on this against, say, sentiment analysis. And stuff that an algorithm interprets as negative is often indexed as positive by the person who contributed it. Yeah, so, and that, that's very frequent. Well, one of the reasons is people are self-deprecating, okay. dependent on the culture. Yeah, yeah they, they may not mean it negatively. We, we allow, and this is key, we allow that interpretation. We don't hand it over to an algorithm or an expert. Fascinating. So as we're starting to wrap up on our time here, so any other you know, sage advice to people who are, and I think we can assume that they're going to dig into the materials uh, that we're going to share with them after, but any ways of approaching this at, at various levels of leadership, right? As in, in terms of bringing in the sense making into your decision making. And there's two or three things. The, the EU field guide is quite important because one of the reasons people buy McKinsey's or Price Waterhouse is you don't get fired for implementing a big mm-hmm. consultancy report. Whereas you do get fired if you implement a small consultancy report. That's what a lot of the agile community haven't realized. Now it's a commodity. Corporate procurement will go to the big guys, not the small guys. Yeah. That's just life. Right? So one of the things the field guide does is it's the first major publication which completely endorses a complexity approach and nothing else. So that actually removes the risk for people in adoption. Mm-hmm. And that's entirely based on Kinevin. Secondly, be very careful on Kinevin because a lot of people just pick it up and use it as a crude categories or draw it as a two by two. Or I get people, because there's a complex domain, they think there must be things in it. So they say, for example, traffic in Mumbai is, co- is co- chaotic, but it isn't. I mean, I know it at walking. If you walk in a straight line at a constant space, the traffic won't hit you. That's complex. Okay? It's, it's working off heuristics. So we actually have, in fact, we're, I just put out a probe on um, Twitter. Just, we're thinking about organizing a three-day masterclass second week in November in the East Coast. Because we're now starting to travel again. So, yeah, there's lots of people around doing really good work with Kinevin. Google Scholar has got thousands of examples. Um, Stan used it in Afghanistan, read team of teams. It's all in the sequel to that. Read all of that stuff, but try and go back to the original material. And the original material is always published on 1st of March on the wiki. That's always the latest version, and it always traces back to the earlier ones. And as I say, you know, Get trained by somebody who understands it rather than by somebody who's just read the Harvard Review article and has decided to reposition it with an occasional dot in the middle. People don't, people don't realize. I mean, I use a lot of phrases, all right? And you see them coming back from people. Yeah. Um, you realize they've just watched the podcast. We had somebody the other day, he's created a training course on something where all he's done is watch a podcast and now he says he's an expert in it. It's hysterical. So, what can we expect? And I know how much you can say on the March 1st, because you've been using the word ordered more than I've, I've heard previously. So is, is that becoming more first class? What? No, I think the key, key thing about Kinevin is we always said Kinevin is a both-hand framework. So stop trying to throw everything out which worked and realize it worked within boundaries. I mean, that was one of my drivers. I just got fed up with fans, you know, mm-hmm. and old enough to have lived through them all, you know, process re-engineering, Six Sigma, Blue Ocean Strategy, and now Agile. And every time we got value, but no, nothing was universal. So kind of like, I think that's the key thing to remember, right? Is don't get seduced into a single approach. Yeah, you know, Kinevin is a sense-making framework. It's designed to allow you to see how different things can combine in different ways. It's not designed to control the way you think. Yeah? And it comes from natural science, not from social science. Mm-hmm. That's the other key thing. Now there is, there is, I mean, I've just got a paper which is in review with John Turner and Nigel Thurler. And we're taking constructor theory in physics and applying that around Kinevin. So in constructor theory, the way it works is you define a counterfactual space. So you define what isn't possible. And then within that space, you create constructors which produce replicable outcomes. Now, that is a radical switch in strategy. So rather than saying where you want to be, you say what you can't be. And then you construct constructors. Now, that contains the concept of scaffolding. So you may see the Kinevin framework. We may stop using constraints and start using scaffolding because too many people see constraints in a gold rat sense. 
Huh. And that can cause confusion. I agree. I think some of the misapplications I'm seeing in this is, is this linear notion of on theory of constraints, because as, as we know in knowledge networks and in other kinds of networks, which all of this is, where... There's a lot to do with it. I mean, we did, we did a three-day exploratory with the theory of constraints guys in Chicago, and Steve Holt has written some really good stuff on theory of constraints in Kinevin. It's like we did the same at Uda down at Quantica. So we are now actively working with other bodies of theory to show how they map and where they're different. And then just some parting thoughts. I think one of the things that I found so fascinating, what you said, that we're now in like generation three of our, or four of, of IT, of technology, of understanding how to yeah. collaborate around code and architecture versus I think 50 or 60 in medicine and then the, uh, a few more, five or six in the aircraft design. So I do get the sense that a better understanding of complexity is actually going to be a key catalyst and what you've contributed with Kinevin as we go into the fifth. It is. I think I think technology is finally getting to the point where it's a tool. Yeah. And the thing about a tool is when you pick it up, it fits your hand. You don't have to buy or re-engineer your brain and your hand to fit it. And technology has required people to change too much. I think it's now become pervasive, right? And I say, so I think low code I find really interesting. I, I don't think it's quite there yet. And I think we came out of 4GLs and 5GLs far too fast. And it's not that much further ahead of 4GLs, but that's another story. The, the ability of people with deep knowledge to write code. I mean, the, the way I did it in the end, all right, is I would write the systems in a 4GL called FCS. Then I'd hand it over to some programmers and they'd rewrite the subroutines in C++. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was far more effective than writing it in C++ in the first place because you had that user. We, we've got to co-evolve users and technology, and we're now getting an increasingly IT-literate generation of managers, and that's going to change things. And we need more cognitive diversity. The, the yeah. problem is because the IT community is so mathematical, it's actually increasingly autistic. And that's giving a problem on understanding. Yeah, that, that's why we train users to talk to IT people. It's easier. And a lot of Scrum people, it's almost like, would you please give me the story points, then please go away so I can produce something and tick a box. And I think a lot of the methods have become, give us something precise we can deliver, and then we'll say we've done it. And nobody's concerned about what people do with it. And I think so that's stop pretending where I you're in the go. complicated or obvious domain when you're not and recognizing a diversity of leadership is key. And stop, stop assuming that users don't, I mean, I've done this for years, all right? I mean, the IT industry invented data flow diagrams and entity models so that users could sign up to something they didn't understand and we could hold them accountable for it later. Yeah. Yeah, we, yeah. we need to get into these short cycle co-evolutionary processes with active engagement between users. And we've got to stop putting users in a box or calling them a product manager or a user executive. Yeah, you've got to engage with their real world experiences, not with their summarized experiences. It's why I don't like story points. There's too much, there's too much summary in it. Right. And then I think also accept when the way that we engage won't be efficient. If it's chaotic, you will be let's call it, it spending will be effective more. but not efficient. Yeah, and, it'll be effective. Exactly. Yeah, and there's a good example on that. So um, this is very prosaic. So um in Australia, we work for a long time with Meals on Wheels. They take meals to old people, and they have distributed kitchens and distribution, so they cost a bit more money. So the government have been sponsoring a new, super-efficient, centrally-managed kitchen, which produces everything. They got COVID big time, and all of a sudden they can't supply, whereas the distributed system has got resilience. Mm -hmm. So resilience I define as survival with continuity of identity over time, and I see anti-fragile as a subset of resilience which has got me blocked by Talib. I'm one of many people blocked by the Talib, so it's, it's kind of like an honor, right? You're not allowed to disagree with the God. Resilient systems are highly inefficient, but they're very effective because they have high levels of redundancy in them. And good code needs redundancy. Wow, excellent. Okay, Dave, thank you so much. We are we are at our time. I don't know if you have any more closing thoughts to add to that, but that was, that was amazing. Yeah, and I encourage no, everyone. Do the resources that will link. Okay, well, one last thing. What are you most excited about that you're working on next or that you're doing now? Oh, constructive theory and strategy. That's beyond IT. I think, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going way beyond what they've done on the physics side. So I'm combining that. I mean, this is what I like doing. I'm combining that with Deleuze and Derrida and philosophy. And give, give me another six months and we'll have a deeply pragmatic approach to corporate strategy, which is evolutionary 
and based on exploring mm. spaces you didn't know it existed and that's what i'm working on at the moment Okay, fascinating. And I do encourage everyone to to follow the cognitive edge, cognitive-edge.com and and Dave's blog as well. So thank you so much for that, Dave. That was that was just amazing. Okay. A huge thank you to Dave for joining me on this episode. For more, follow me and my journey on LinkedIn, Twitter, or using the hashtags Myth Plus One or Project to Product. You can reach out to Dave on Twitter at S-N-O-D-E-D or via LinkedIn. I have a new episode every two weeks, so hit subscribe to join us again. You can also search for Project to Product to get the book. And remember that all author proceeds go to supporting women and minorities in technology. Thanks, and until next time.